All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the waiting room. Let me just check once more. Did anyone just join from our group? No. Uh, they they haven't, but I will. I'll keep. Okay. All right. I'll a diligent eye. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to uh, the Brooklyn Rails 517th New Social Environment Talk. Um, today marks actually our two-year anniversary of these conversations, um, which maybe is fitting. A lot has changed um, since two years ago. Um, I'm Carolyn, the program's associate here at The Rail, um, and I have the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Anna Chisosterova, Luba Drost, Adriana Farmiga, Susan Katz, Yulia Kostareva, Marina Slavova, Anton Sviatsky, Vladimir Us, Lika Volk, and um, Ksenia M. Sobolova as our host. Um, we're also thrilled to welcome poet Ostap Keen um, here uh, later to close the program. Um, we would like to thank Simon Dev from CEC Arts Link for helping uh, make today's event possible. And thanks to all of our um, uh, guests and our host as well for really um, doing so much organizing for this so quickly. Um, here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenin Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The Brooklyn Rail um, stands in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. Um, the immense tragedy and atroc atrocities unfolding feel quite impossible to put into language, um, but we hope to provide here a space, um, especially for Ukrainian voices um, and support. Um, and we'll be posting various resources in the chat throughout the conversation today. P please um, feel free to add um, and or share those resources. Um, and now I'll introduce um, our host. Um, Ksenia M. Soboleva is a writer, art historian, and curator based in New York City and specializes in queer art and culture. She was the 2020-2021 Marika and Jan Vilsack uh, Curatorial Fellow at the Guggenheim, um, where she co-organized the Jillian Waring Retrospective. She's currently an Andrew W. Mellon Gender and LGBTQ History, History Fellow Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society Museum and Library. So thanks, and I'll hand it over to you, Ksenia. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you to everybody at the Brooklyn Rail for making this possible and for the continued support. Uh, I remember that we were actually doing a tech pre-check for one of these talks that I was also a host on, um, on the day that the war started. And I tuned in from my phone as I was walking back from a demonstration at the United Nations and um, Luba was there too. And uh, I thought right away that, that we should have a panel at the Brooklyn Rail dedicated to this. Um, and so this will be the first of many. And uh, I, I cannot believe that it has been three weeks and I am so, incredibly grateful for to all our speakers for being here today because I know that beyond the global impact of the war, each of you is personally affected in different ways. Um, so I don't wanna talk too much because I wanna hear from our speakers and uh, we have quite a few. And uh, my role as moderator is uh, to make sure everybody, everybody gets to speak. So I'm gonna start by reading uh, a one sentence bio for all of our speakers. And then um, I'm gonna give everyone a few minutes to introduce themselves, uh, talk about their uh, practices, art spaces, um, initiatives, or whatever you feel that, that uh, needs to be heard in this moment. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move into uh, questions. And uh, we're going to end with a poetry reading by Ostapkin, uh, which will be both in Ukrainian and English. So 
Susan Katz has been working in the field of international cultural exchange for more than 20 years as CEC ArtLinks program director based until recently in St. Petersburg, Russia. Yulia Kostyorova is an artist and curator based in Kiev, Ukraine, co-founder of Open Place, an initiative directed to extension of creative research and establishment of the links between art process and the different layers of modern society. Anna Chista Chista Shordova is a curator and cultural worker originally from Minsk, Belarus, who currently lives and works in Berlin. Marina Slavova is a gallerist at Struktura Gallery in Sofia, Bulgaria, responsible for the exhibition policy, residency programs, and international communication. Anton Sviatsky is a partner at Fragment Gallery in New York and Moscow. Vladimir Us is an artist, curator, and bicycle tourer from Chisinau, Moldova, and founding member of the Oberlich Association. Luba Drost was born in Lviv, Ukraine, and lives in New York City. She is a site-specific installation artist working with sound, 3D animation, and sculpture. Lika Folk is a Ukrainian-born artist based in New York. In 2019, she organized Cultural Capital Introspection International Art Program in Ushugarot, Ukraine, and in 2021 opened the Always Fresh Art Space in a foreclosed pizzeria on the Lower East Side. And finally, Adriana Formiga is an interdisciplinary artist whose work addresses formations of identity by way of conceptual still life and assemblage. Formiga is a faculty member in sculpture and associate dean at the Cooper Union School of Art. So welcome everyone. Uh, and Susan, would you mind starting us off? Yes, thank you, Xenia. Um, so I'm Susan Katz and I am um, a program director at CC Arts Link. And CC Arts Link is an international cultural exchange organization that has been working um, in the countries of um, the former Soviet Union, Central and Eastern Europe, and a total of 37 countries doing cultural exchanges for more than 50 years. And for the last 20 years, I've been based in St. Petersburg, um, running our cultural programs in Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union. And two weeks ago, my family and I decided that it wasn't safe to stay in Russia, and we, we left. Um, so now, as an organization, we are trying to refocus our work and to um, address the horrific things that have happened and to provide support to artist communities um, in the regions that we work, and specifically directing our efforts towards Ukrainian artists and arts workers, as well as artists and cultural workers at risk from Russia and Belarus. And so now the question that we have is how do we do this? And we've been working with a, a network of organizations um, in 10 countries of the former Soviet Union and now also in Bulgaria um, called the Art Prospect Network. And several people from this network are participating in the meeting today. And um, we have always, the focus of this network has been in exchanging um, information um, between organizations that are committed to social practice art. And we always um, had a lot of interregional exchanges. And so now we're trying to continue to do that, but really focusing on providing support to artists from Ukraine and Belarus through these residencies and having um, providing opportunities for them to be in residence in the countries in the region. Um, while we're trying to focus a lot of our programs on Ukraine and providing opportunities for residencies and other forms of support, I think that for us, another, a key element of our work has always been in a, um, facilitating a dialogue between artists and artist communities around the world. And um, you know, we definitely feel that today that's more critical than ever. And as someone who's lived in Russia for a long time and you know, support the people there, I know that the people in my community are very much against the war and don't know how to express it. And um, I think it's really critical that our organization continues to support them as well. So we're trying to find ways to keep the programs that we were doing in Russia um, going and having an ongoing dialogue between Russian artists and American artists. And that's something that we'll try to do as long as it's safe to do it. So, um, I guess I just want to say that, you know, like everyone, we're horrified by what's happening and really trying to find ways to support um, artists at risk from the region. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, Yulia, can we move on to you? 
Uh, yes, uh, open place initiative uh, of artists with the primary objectives to facilitate discussion, discussion exchange of opinion and ideas um, uh, between artists and curator and various social groups from across Ukraine and other uh, country. Now, because of the Russian war, uh, our members are in the different cities and countries. Uh, the people who stay in Ukraine uh, from our team mostly provide humanitarian and social activity. And me being in Warsaw support initi initiatives who provide emergency residency for artists, as well as to help artists with the logistics and necessary, that the, like necessary things that they might need uh, to for their work here. Thank you, Yulia. Um, Anna? Hello to everyone. Mm. <clears throat> it's like for until 2020, I was running the probably main independent cultural private institution in Belarus, which was called U Gallery of Contemporary Art. Uh, due to the political regime, uh, my gallery was closed and I was pressed to move out from country. And now I'm talking with you from Berlin, where I have temporary uh, stay, at least for one year. And since uh, last year, me and my partner from the gallery, Valentina Kisilova, we established an uh, initiative which is called uh, Ambassador Kulturi, uh, Embassy of Culture. Uh, which uh, trying to provide not only resources for cultural workers in need from Belarus, uh, because unfortunately after president elections we had in 2020, almost all independent cultural uh, infrastructure and community was destroyed and people were pressed also to leave country. But uh, for last three weeks, uh, with a curatorial group of independent creators, we're also working on a creation of online platform for supports Ukraine. Uh, it will be an international platform and later, now we are testing this platform and I think that later I can provide you information and uh, kindly invite you to join our initiative as well. Thank we would you. love that. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Anton? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Anton. I'm the partner at Fragment Gallery, which recently opened a New York location uh, and was founded in Moscow and unfortunately has to close in Moscow and because of Russia invading Ukraine. Um, it's, I mean, it's very hard to speak on what we can do now. I'm sure everybody's feeling really powerless and us included and all we've been doing in the past several weeks is just collecting money and sending money directly to artists in Ukraine and trying to help them um, survive. Um, and it, it feels like we're gonna keep doing that for a while yet. Um, but long-term, the mission of the gallery has always been to support Eastern and Central European artists and facilitate um, access to Western discourse and Western institutions for them. And so we have an international program. We've always worked with Ukrainian, Belarusian, Russian, um, former Soviet bloc artists from you know, Croatia and other countries. So we're going to continue doing that. We're going to refocus on Ukraine. And I've made it sort of my personal mission to um, start a conversation with other galleries in New York, uh, not a members, to um, become more familiar with Ukrainian and Eastern European artists and to build deeper connections and to show them and to give them uh, more visibility and secure their futures. And I feel like this is going to be a very long-term project um, and initiative that I hope will just develop into a common practice among um, the American community because I feel like um, the region here has been largely underrepresented for a very long time. And so the understanding that Americans have of the region is very lacking. Um, that's also part of the problem. I mean, a lot of people 
who immigrated to the U.S. from the former Soviet countries, and you know, they would say where they are from when asked. Um, nine out of ten people wouldn't know where Latvia is, or where Ukraine is, or where you know, Lithuania is. So these people were just adopt the sort of quasi-Russian identity, and that's a problem. And to address that, we need to develop a much more comprehensive understanding of Eastern Europe um, to be able to differentiate these identities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marina, do we have Marina? Yes, I'm here. Hello to everybody. My name is Marina. I am a gallerist at Struktura Gallery in Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, Struktura functions as an independent uh, space in Sofia, trying to both uh, represent Bulgarian artists internationally, but our main focus is basically to establish uh, and to help, sustain, uh, help build sustainable international connections with artists and curators worldwide. And as part of the Art Prospect Network, um, we are um, trying to, to focus even more on uh, Central and Eastern Europe as part of this part of the world. Um, so we are trying to take uh, part in this difficult conversation to see how we can support um, Ukrainian artists and the artistic community um, and to see how we could be helpful in these horrible times. Thank you, Marina. Um, do we have Vladimir? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Vladimir. Uh, I work in Oberlicht Association in Tishno, Republic of Moldova. Um, one of the questions that we raise is how to... Um, uh, the, is the question of self-organizing of the independent cultural community here but also how to provide uh, more resilience uh, to, the, to our community to different types of crises, among them economic, ecological, and more recently humanitarian crises. Uh, after the fall of Soviet Union, we've been witnessing uh, many of our citizens uh, forced to live abroad for, in search of work. Uh, which uh, consequently produced uh, other social problems in, in Moldova. Uh, and uh, also during pandemics, it was very obvious that the cultural community is uh, basically a very precarious group of people who struggle to uh, survive. And now we have uh, the war in, uh, in our neighborhood uh, in Ukraine with whom we share uh, the border and we witness um, other type of provocations. Uh, I mean, the, the enormous fluxes of refugees um, uh, and one of the provocations today is how to not to lose the members of our own community as well, uh, who also uh, uh, are thinking maybe to leave uh, from here. Uh, so one of the questions is what do we learn from all these crises and uh, how to get more resilient uh, in front of them in the future. Uh, and when it comes to refugee crisis, it's a very difficult question because uh, you cannot, how to, which criteria to apply because everyone is in need. Uh, and uh, basically one of the, not solution, but one of the topics which we are thinking uh, lately is uh, the, um, the need for sustainable uh, alternative cultural infrastructure that could uh, be it physical, be it virtual, that could um, support our work. Uh, since 90s, we were witnessing a lot of public spaces being privatized and going into private hands and disappearing from um, uh, from uh, our use, uh, <clears throat> uh, then uh, uh, then with the crises uh, like uh, pandemics or uh, refugee crisis, we just realized that there is no enough public infrastructure to accommodate these fluxes of people. Uh, there is no uh, centers to take care of the people. So a lot of uh, work is done by volunteers, uh, by ordinary citizens taking them uh, to their homes. And um, there is no even uh, 
public bus companies to take the refugees from border to Chisinau and further to Romania. So you will see all these kind of uh, um, situations. And um, uh, this is like, uh, it has to deal with uh, also the questions which we raise in our community with the question of resilience in general. Thank you, Vladimir. Um, and now we'll move on to our artists, uh, Luba. Hi, uh, I'm Luba Drozd. Uh, originally, I was born in Ukraine, in Lviv, uh, in the west of Ukraine. Um, um, I'm an artist, I'm a site specific installation artist. Um, of the, the past, I mean, this uh, situation is not new, right? Uh, it's been going on for decades, the, the imperial oppression of Ukraine by Russia. Um, that's, uh, I feel like we've, a lot of Ukrainian artists have been struggling with that for, for a while. Um, uh, it, right before the bombing started in December, my uh, childhood friend was arrested uh, uh, when Russia abused Interpol and uh, um, he was um, detained in Italy and was fighting uh, extradition to Russia. So that set off the continuing nightmare that doesn't seem to end. Uh, we've been trying to get him out, he's finally out. And uh, then I started uh, fighting this information that's been popping up everywhere, uh, online, Twitter, social media articles. It seems that uh, uh, Russian disinformation uh, permeated so many spaces. Uh, my biggest, um, Fear is that it, a lot of it permeated leftist spaces. I'm very concerned about that. Uh, that's why I've been collecting um, articles and uh, Twitter accounts uh, to follow of Ukrainian journalists, uh, writers, thinkers, uh, links to topics about Ukraine. Um, uh, the Wikipedia on the parliament, Ukrainian parliament, Rada composition, because there was the disinfo about Ukrainian neo-Nazis in parliament, not true. So like just getting basic information out to people so they're educated on the subject and not uh, don't succumb to the propaganda that is so um, intense that sometimes even I get whiplash from it. Um, the past three weeks, uh, five days before the bombing started, I, I called my dad in Ukraine and I told him that he needs to get out immediately, that something is going to be, uh, that I think something terrible is about to happen. And uh, a week after the bombings, I, I got him out and my brother uh, out of Ukraine, so he's now in Poland. I've been um, uh, in contact with my former classmates, uh, raising money. One of them is a volunteer in Kiev uh, who is uh, driving around uh, to block posts around Kiev that are protecting the city and delivering food, medicine, coffee, uh, and food tools. So I raised $4,000 and they could get a surveillance drone, a little video drone, to, the, to see the uh, enemy targets, um, uh, night vision things, equipment, the thermal under, un, underwear, like high-end uh, and all the necessary things. Uh, I also have sent packages of tactical, uh, protective tactical gear to my other classmate who is uh, uh, on the outside of Kiev uh, with a group of people who are also fighting the Russian army, researching bulletproof vests. Just this is, um, it's unconscionable. Uh, I just, it's, it, there's so many directions which I want to direct my help to. And, uh, uh, but I, it's sometimes at a loss of what to do. I wake up at, today I woke up at 3 a.m. just so I could catch up with 
spreading information and keeping contact and figuring out where my refugee family will go and etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just uh, it's been an overwhelming experience together with a group of ukrainian artists in new york we have been meeting and figuring out ways to inform basically the main thing is informing people uh and getting the information out about ukraine uh making it yeah Thank you, Luba, and, and we'd love to hear more about that as well. Um, Lika, maybe we can move on to you. Um, yes, hi, I'm Lika Volk. I used to be Lika Volkova until some time ago. Um, I grew up in Odessa and also I uh, lived in Moscow as a teenager for about five years. I'm, I have a lot of sort of background in both countries in a way. And um, I'm, I don't wanna talk about my practice right now or projects. Um, what I'm mostly like struggling with is how, in, how much in denial um, Russian citizens and Russian community, art community including um, are about what brought this war, what is actually going on, admit like largely admitting that it's Putin's war, but not Russia's war, which is not accurate at all. Not taking risk, like this past three weeks was the first time in my life that I have heard any Russian citizen I know per se saying that maybe we are responsible for what's happening because before it was never admitted. It was always like there's Putin's war and we have nothing to do with Putin, but we could have something to do with Tolstoy. Um, and how does this narrative exactly works and how incredibly um, painful it is to witness um, because unless, until, uh, until uh, Russian, every Russian citizen admits that he's responsible for what's going on, there are gonna be no change. And, the stopping war depends directly on each of us on, and Russian citizens, including. So um, there are a lot of sort of, I can't really even like speak about art community right now because I don't see a difference between average Ukrainian, other Ukrainian citizens or my friends, artists. Um, there are where, like, there are a lot of things that could be suggested, but um, I think the I think share like sort of educating, as Luba said, public on what preceded this war, what Russian culture actually is, how imperial the Russian mind set may be, um, what's the fact that Russia was a slave empire and still has a lot of traces of that. Um, which is not known to public widely because we associate slavery with either race or colonialism. But the fact that Russia was a slave empire of its own people was not is not necessarily a known fact. So there are some like, and then how art world participates in the kind of like current for the past eight years, despite the fact that Russia launched this war in Ukraine. The art community participated in so many Russian programs, um, worked with so many oligarchs. It's just like, I don't know where to start, literally. Like, so this discussion could be helpful in many ways. Yeah. Thank you, Lika. And, and I, have, I have a lot to add to that, actually. But I want to uh, let Adriana speak first. Thank you. Ksenia, good afternoon, Slava Ukraini. Uh, I'm a first generation Ukrainian and I feel like my entire life has been culturally conditioned to absorb this moment and yet the shock waves of it are making it very difficult to function. Um, as an artist, I have been involved in several efforts of organizing. Um, I agree with I agree with the, uh, the two previous points that were made about education. Um, I would like to speak to that maybe a little bit later in our uh, q and I have much to say about that. Um, it's, 
so yeah, so we're involved in a few efforts. There's a there's a large artsy auction that I'm helping organize that is about to happen. Um, there are other auctions that are happening. Lot, there's lots of mobilization, um, but I think there is a shortcoming and a challenge in the space of education and at the same time, managing that awareness with the daily function of waking up, checking in on family in Ukraine. I still have family in Ukraine. Are they alive? Do they have food? They've been running out of food as of two weeks ago. Uh, my family, not that this is a luxury, but some of my family members do not have the opportunity or the luxury to actually leave. <laughs> the country, there is complications with family uh, trauma and generational trauma that relates to those of us who did leave and found ourselves here in the States. Um, so there, there's like, you know, th there's, a, there's a series, there's a constellation of um, experiences that I have been undergoing in the last three weeks. And, you know, it, it, it's difficult, it's difficult to not have a feeling of hopelessness being so remote, but um, doing what I can with whom I can, whenever I can, and trying to just make it through the day. So I will, I will end it there for now. Thank you, Adriana, and thank you to everyone for sharing your stories. And uh, I, I'd love to hear more about all the initiatives and, and the ways that um, everyone who's participating today can help and uh, become involved. Uh, Lika, I actually maybe want to start by uh, by picking up on what you were saying. Um, you know, I need to acknowledge right away that um, I am a Russian citizen. Um, my mother and I left Russia when I was eight, exactly because it was very shitty. And uh, we are an ethnic minority within Russia. We're Tatar. And um, I have been writing articles anti-Putin over the years, you know, I'm proud and out, out and proud lesbian. Um, and pointing out how the violence that Putin is enacting on its own people, right? And what I have found over the past three weeks to be the case is that a lot of people think that Russia is a democracy and it's not. Um, and the news is censored to the point of, you know, if you haven't lived there and, and sort of you can't compare, uh, it, it's unimaginable, it's just unreal. And so how, you know, I think, um, and I, I actually, I, I had a, I have an opinion piece coming out about this, but I, I had an instance where um, I, an article on this was gonna come out by me, um, with a journal that I regularly contribute to. And then it was pulled um, because it, they felt that my voice in this case was inappropriate uh, as a Russian. And so it's, you know, I'm curious what you think about how do we, how do we turn, how do we wake up the Russian population? I think that uh, for sure, everyone outside of Russia needs to be actively outspoken and actively participating uh, in anti-war and anti-Putin initiatives. But how do people within Russia who, a lot of them, like my grandma turns on the news, she has no idea that a war is happening, right? How do we make sure that those people have access to what is actually happening? How do we turn and Susan, maybe you can speak to that as well. How do you turn the Russian population against Putin? Because I think that that is what needs to happen, you know, and there has been a mass exodus. There was just a, a New York Times article about this today of, of Russians and anti-Putin Russians leaving Russia, right? And so if all the people who actually know what's happening are leaving Russia, then what stays in Russia are the people that have no clue, you know, and I, by no means want to equate Ukrainians running from bullets with Russians running from their government, but I do think that this is that is this is a discussion that needs to be had. And also, you know, films are being pulled from film festivals. Yes, if there's they have state funding, sure, but 
there is a cultural boycott beyond state funding. And um, it, it just feels to me like that's basically doing Putin's job for him. He's already silencing Russian dissidents. So now the rest of the world is gonna silence Russian dissidents as well. Um, is it okay if I respond or you want to, because, um, and please cut me if I take too much time, because it's a very, I think it's also maybe a generational um, gap because I mostly know, um, I know how it's like, of course, like we can talk about the fact that majority of American intellectuals don't know that Soviet Union was also um, an oppressed state, basically a form of slavery. But then also I, what I've witnessed when I was uh, a teenager in Moscow is how easy it was for the same people in like Russian art community, um, Russian artists, intellectuals, to so fast switch from kind of democratic direction to literally what I can call Russian Nazism. Um, there is someone whose name is, I'm sure you're familiar, Alexander Dugin, who is a Putin ideologist who used to openly go around and recruit artists and uh, Russian intellectuals um, to his ideology of like Fourth Reich, of Russian domination, of Russian world. And whenever I hear that it's Putin's war, I disagree because I, what I read now still is like, I read an article by Katya Dogets, for example, saying, I have nothing to do with it, it's Putin's war, which is not necessarily like, I think it, the change in Russia has to start with people whose voices are important, declaring the fact that they did participate in this ideological shift, in this like growing sentiment against um, neighboring countries. Um, it has to be admitted as a part of Russian culture. This war to me is a part of Russian culture. It, it's the, like the, you can say that so many people are afraid to speak out, but fear in itself is also a part of Russian culture. And it has to be addressed, I think, first and foremost. And then we can think how to affect people who are in watching like brainwashed by TV because TV is a tool. And then there are a lot of ways I believe that technology can help. I don't know, many other things can help. But if you think about minority of Russian population that are strongly anti-war, and I think I believe it's like about 10% that are ready to be vocal, they cannot organize because they cannot, they don't feel protected and they don't feel together. So, and 10 million people is a lot of people like it's a lot of people coming out on the streets and we're seeing only like tens of thousands of people sometimes. And those who do come out are brave and I want to praise them by all means. But I think like, for me, it's problematic when I hear that this is Putin's war. And once again, you are a part of younger generation. Perhaps there are more people whom I don't know who are strongly opposed to this war from the younger generations of Russians, but everyone I, whose voices like sort of have weight, like Katya Dogut and so many other Russian intellectuals who distance themselves from what's going on. I think that's that's the problem to me. I don't know. Yeah, no, and, and I agree with you. And I, uh, you know, when, when the war started, there was, a, there was a performance artist who burned her passport, Russian mm -hmm. passport in front of a consulate and mm -hmm. sold it as an NFT. And while I admired the fundraising effort, I was very critical of the gesture because, you know, that way you're just saying, oh, I'm not Russian, so this is not my war. And for me, I want to acknowledge that I'm Russian and this war is being pursued in my name. Mm -hmm. And then what can I do, right? And uh, Susan, I, since you were in Russia, um, what are the ways that you can um, enact resistance without it just being completely censored right away? Um, and especially in terms of communities that are already vulnerable, you know, like the queer community in Russia, like a lot of my friends in Russia, they. they 
they can go out on the street to protest. I mean, a lot of them are now, but when, for example, when the Navalny uh, demonstrations were happening, right, I, I noticed that People didn't want to talk about it. They disappeared from social media. And I realized that they're already so vulnerable to go out on the street and protest. They, you know, would be thrown into jail. And then when they're queer or trans, it's just, you know, it, it, it's very dangerous. Yeah, I, I wish I had a, a good answer for what you're talking about. And Lika, I wanted to say that I really appreciated your words because I think they really need to be heard by the Russian community and for people to really understand what this problem has such a long history and that it's so much more complicated than saying that, you know, it is Putin's war. And I think I've been really saddened um, looking on social media and seeing the discussions between Ukrainians and Russians who really both are against the war, who I think share have you know shared history and collaborated for so many years, but they can't discuss these issues anymore. And it's become very nasty. And what you said in such a, I think an eloquent way is something that Russians really need to hear and really need to acknowledge and accept. And I think you're completely right that people need to accept responsibility for what has happened in Ukraine and that this isn't something that just Putin did. Um, and I think probably everybody here knows how um, helpless I think so many people feel in Russia about affecting change. I mean. The number of people that I know who don't vote, who don't go to demonstrations is, is huge, even though they're against the system. And, you know, it's both out of fear and out of a feeling that they can't affect change. And um, I think, you know, it, it, it isn't, it's right now, I'm, when I talk to friends who are still in Russia, you know, most people I know want to leave, but don't have the opportunity. And, Right now, they keep saying, we don't feel like it's our country anymore. And they're afraid even to go outside because they see these nationalistic flags, they see the Z, they feel the country has changed so quickly. And I don't know how we can sort of, I mean, we need to empower these people to be able to feel that they can affect change and to talk about it. And I, I truly don't know what the answer is. How do you do this? But I guess it's starting with the small communities that we know share these feelings and having them talk with each other, but also talking to people like you, Lika, and people in Ukraine and trying to have a conversation about the situation in a non-aggressive way. And I, I realize that during the war, this may not be possible, but I think it's something that really has to be done. Yeah, and remaining in dialogue, I think it's so important, which is why I'm so grateful to everybody on this panel for, for wanting to be on the panel, for making the time, uh, for being together. And uh, Adriana, I know that, that you wanted to make a point uh, about education. So I think maybe this is a nice, um, a good time. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the answer or one, one of the answers to the questions that you posed and that we've just discussed discussed about what can be done now is my my answer would maybe be three pronged which is the first would be for not just the russian community but the global community the world to educate itself now is the best time and the phenomenon of russification has had a jump start on the world's attention span by at least a century so for people to educate themselves about the way ukraine Ukrainian culture and the Ukrainian language are not Russian and that we are not the same people is a start. Our history precedes that of Russia's by a long stretch and our language alone with its variabilities of grammar and alphabet is something like 38 to 40 percent different. That is significant. So as an example, you can look at Spanish and Italian if you want to get like a clearer understanding of, of the differences. You should also know that Ukrainians and their language have been referred to as subhuman, as primitive. And we have literally been, been characterized as unevolved. And this has been going on for a very long time. 
And yet for the majority of recent history, Russia has had no problem in trying to assimilate Ukrainians and appropriate our cultural heritage. So I think there is plenty of an opportunity for the world now to start educating itself. I believe that is step one. And then I think just to pivot back to Ukrainians, and you know, if we're talking about solidarity with Ukrainians, what can be done? Well, number two would be to give, give us a voice, give us a platform. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I agree we need to have dialogue. If there are artists, give us shows, give us gallery shows, institutional shows. We are not a monolith. We work in very different ways. My work is very different than Luba's as an example but we're able to represent Ukraine, being Ukrainian and Ukrainianness in some rich, vibrant and nuanced ways. And I think, you know, the, the third, and we can speak about this, and I know there are links being put up in the chat about how people can help, but I don't think what people realize is that Ukraine has been used as a human shield, as a human shield of Russian imperialism for a long time. So this is not new, but, in, in this year, with this war, the ramifications of what is happening now on global energy and food systems will be felt exponentially the longer this plays out. So we can talk about resources later, but I believe that there's a multi-pronged approach, the first being education and educating oneself just at the very, at the very base level, the distinction between Ukrainian and Russian. So that's, that's my two cents on it. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, th I think a few people have said that, you know, this is not new, not only has this been going on for eight years, but also this is not the first war. And this is not the first time Russian troops have been in a, you know, sovereign territory and, or American troops. And um, there is, I think, you know, in terms of um, cultural bo boycotts, I think there there is also an interesting parallel and dichotomy between, uh, for example, uh, the the way that Israeli organizations were boycotted, and people were having a lot of trouble getting behind that, um, and the way that now there there is this, you know, there just is this really growing tension. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if this is something that is just felt here in the West, or if is this a tension that you are feeling uh, in Eastern Europe? And maybe Yulia and Anna, you can speak to that. Like, are people remaining in dialogue? What are um, yeah, mm. um, I was not going to speak about this because um, I, th I think I can be very emotional, but I uh, really support boycott and uh, we as an organization uh, make it public and uh, I believe that each cultural institution should be clear about own political position and uh, uh, declare it publicly. This is the one thing which we didn't do like clearly before, and now we have the situation. You asked Ksenia uh, why, and that I also uh, want to ask what made people so vulnerable in Russia now? Uh, because it was like 22 years of Putin uh, under the power, and uh, people choose to be unpolitical and uh, not to express and uh, inactive just uh, uh, perceive uh, what he did. And you are right that it is not the first time in Ukraine. Before it was Georgia, but before it was like uh, the same Afghanistan uh, started, then Moldova, then Georgia, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan. So it's like uh, everything around. And uh, in, in intellectuals choose not to uh, to be active. Uh, also, I would like to add about that this is a Putin war. No, this is not the Putin war because until people feel Putin and uh, 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 recognize him as a legitimate president, this is uh, Putin represent Russia. So this is a Russian people who actually uh, allow him to do this. 
being an active and uh, so on. So that's why I support boycott and um, uh, uh, we also uh, in Ukraine, we have this practice and yeah, and one more that uh, the rights doesn't given, the rights uh, is uh, taken. Yes, so you, if you want to have rights, you need to fight for that. And uh, uh, then in Ukraine, we have the uh, like long practice of boycotting our institution as well. And uh, this bring changes. Uh, and why people in Russia not, does, didn't react when there was violation of different NGOs, when the memorial was uh, like kicked out and cultural institution like Polish Institute was kicked out from Russia. Why people didn't, uh, they feel that this is not their uh, like site. And then uh, they became well vulnerable, yes? So sorry. <laughs> No need to apologize at all. Uh, and I have to say, I by no means am trying to defend Russia. I'm so grateful to my mother for realizing how fucked up the situation there was and for getting us out a long time ago. Um, all I'm saying is that uh, having been in Russia and, and, and having experience there, um, I uh, am perhaps a little more familiar with the quieter ways that resistance can take place. And just because it's not in the view of the West and on social media doesn't mean that there is no resistance. Um, and, you know, I, I can't access my, my own website in Russia because every page has the word lesbian on it. And so, you know, it's like the, just the amount of censorship, it's really, um, so I guess my question back to you is how, 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 how can individuals, you know, how, how can every Russian individual resist? If, if you put a post on social media, it's just removed. I'm not saying that they shouldn't. I think that every, I mean, they can't arrest everyone. And actually this woman on the, on the, on TV running, running onto the set with the, with the sign of they are lying to you. You know, when I first saw that, I thought somebody montaged this, 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 can't, this can't be real. There's no way this could have happened in Russia. And when I realized that it had, that gave me a sense of hope because I do think that finally people are, you know, braving 15 years in jail. Like if you, if you refer to, uh, to the war in Ukraine as an invasion, war, conflict, anything along those lines, it's a 15 year prison sentence. And, and people are being arrested for carrying blank signs with signs that there was a person carrying a blank sign, nothing on it, still arrested for protesting. Yeah, you just uh, one remark, the Ukrainian people and the people who are in Ukraine just killed because being Ukrainian and living in this country, you know? Let's compare the same. Oh, I don't mean to compare at all. No. Susan, I think you were going to say something. No. Lika. It's like sort of if we are in this territory of culture and art, right? Then it's one, maybe there could be something said. Otherwise, I don't think it's us Ukrainians right now who can necessarily like answer to the question how Russians can brave up um, and what does it entail to risk. Um, but I don't think historically artist means someone who doesn't risk their lives. Like we know so many examples of artists going to war, dying young, fighting in wars. Um, for ideological reasons, sometimes life in itself or death, I would say, is not even death as, as the worst case scenario, is not the worst outcome that we can imagine. And maybe starting from reflection on fear itself, what does it make Russian people to be so afraid of? I don't know, taking action, right? I think what makes them afraid is that they're not sure 
that they are supported by each other. Like at least this is how it feels for Ukrainians. Like why were, why are we like, I see people in my country and myself, like sort of, I, I went to learn how to shoot guns. It's not something to brag about, but it's like you feel the physicality of, 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 of existence, but like, what, what, what makes it so, like what makes it possible for Ukrainians to be proactive is the fact that they feel each other's support. Like if you feel that, if you go on the street and with you, there will be millions of people who will come fight for you, then your fear just dissolves. It's not about, it's no longer about sort of astronaut and the gear that like comes with, with this, you know, way to grab you. You feel like you believe in things that are shared among your peers and they will stand up for you. So for some reason, there's something, and this is like, I think this is the problem that somehow historically Russia evolved as this like almost like, of course it's a propaganda, of course there are ways to manipulate like sort of public sentiment, but people evolved century after century with the psyche of sort of being okay, delegating their sense of agency to someone else. Like that's that's how like kind of the transition of slaves, like kind of a slave empire from being oppressed physically than being oppressed physically than just accepting the fact that you're gonna be oppressed no matter what. Like this has to be resisted because nothing guarantees that like things don't change and i don't know how to start this in in russia like th this is not sort of our our place to to suggest um, but yeah this can go on <laughs> like the, the bottom yeah. line it's like it can't go on like this like something needs to if russians think that it's impossible for them, for example, to protest physically on the streets. There are other ways. There are like ways to, I don't know, to block internet. There are like plenty of Russian intelligent hackers that could organize some kind of form of stranger resistance. I don't know, but it's a matter of support. Like there is no consensus. Like there is, I think that, I don't know what it is, honestly. But fear in itself no, <laughs> is part of a problem. I, I, I think that uh, I, I think that what you're saying about just the acceptance that things aren't going to change is just spot on. And I think that what brings Ukrainians together is also, you know, they elected their president, whereas in Russia, there is an acceptance of, you know, it voting doesn't matter because it's not it's not a real vote. And uh, I agree with Adriana that we should recenter uh, the conversation around Ukraine and and just you know uh, and I know we have been talking about Russia and I'm grateful for all of you to all of you for having this awkward conversation with me and I because I do strongly believe that that the way to end this is to get Putin out uh, and I think that Russians play a critical role in getting Putin out because he can't arrest everyone. So, uh, but I apologize for, for centering it around Russia for a little too long. Uh, you Can I say something? Yeah, uh, like I also was, uh, it, the centering felt extremely uh, discombobulating to me right now. And uh, uh, I've seen the, this kind of centering a lot in conversations about, uh, uh, Ukraine, it, it keeps happening. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. And it feels like an, yet another form of appropriation. It's an appropriation of pain, right? Ukrainians are being bombed and their pain is appropriated to, to focus on uh, Russian dissidents right now. This conversation should happen, but people like Yulia said, there's like a bomb was dropped on a theater that said children yesterday and we should we should should focus on 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 su supporting people there in conversations in solidarity with ukraine right now 
Thank you. Vladimir and Marina and Anton and Anna, I feel like. Um... I just wanted to add because like uh, uh, me now is a totally strange situation because uh, the war conflict started from the land of Belarus, in fact. And we have to say also that the territory of Belarus is also now somehow occupied. And about the way of thinking of, I, I really, can't say that Russians, Belarusians, whatever, former Soviet people, it's also the point, the critical point for this war, because uh, in some countries like Ukraine or Georgia, uh, it was already a process of last 30 years of self-reflection on the Soviet strategy, which was like for 70 years. Unfortunately, in Belarus, and I think in Russia, uh, there is not enough self reflections and thinking about past because what, what we still have for last uh, in my country already is 27 years and more than 20 years in Russia uh, it's also things we have uh, responsibility for uh, and I think that not only people in my country and in Russia but also people all over the world have to also reflect on past. And now I'm based in Berlin and they know how it works. I see how it works, uh, the reflection on past and the previous, uh, I don't know, violence, which was happening in history. Um, and this process of education, which you somehow mentioned twice today, um, it's very important for everyone because I think that too many countries also around the world now in one step to like continue these processes in very different points around the world. So it's just a shortly because honestly last three weeks I'm already speechless and I don't know, I, I do something but Sometime, from time to time, I'm seeing what the reason for this and how I can really help my friends, colleagues, and people in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vladimir, Anton, uh, Marina, do you have anything to add? Mm, I can try. Uh, I, I, am, I think our role, if we speak of ourselves, uh, is to educate and that you know, through the means that we have and um, art and culture can be a powerful tool for that. <clears throat> uh, and here I support this um, idea that uh, it's not only Putin's war, but uh, we all contribute to it to a certain degree. Uh, we have a very interesting initiative in Moldova called Spalatria Theater. And one of their play was about um, <clears throat> a Jewish Holocaust in Chisinau, and uh, not, on, not in Chisinau, in Transnistrian region during the Second World War. And the participation of Moldovan population uh, in the Holocaust itself. So, uh, and this kind of issue, they are totally out of uh, history books. No one would learn about any, like us as a nation or country taking part in something like that. Uh, so these are absolutely unknown uh, things which uh, cultural actors, artists can really make visible. So in that sense, I second the idea of education, but maybe not only in terms of making a difference, but rather adopting a critical distance towards events and uh, having a distance which allows us to analyze those events exactly, make a difference from the TV as a tool. Um, and the, here, what can I say? I think the discussion is about two, two um, somehow went into, is a, could develop on two levels. One level we try to speak now about our role as citizens of this or that country what can we do or what we are not able to do, but then what about the politicians who fail? And uh, this is, I think, another uh, issue we need to raise. Um, 
in our case, we already tried to, for many years, uh, develop a collaboration with artists from Transnistrian region, which uh, there was a civil war, but backed by Russian army in 1992, which created a separatist region in Moldova. And all these years, we don't see almost any progress uh, from uh, politicians. Uh, so uh, we can try to do it individually as artists, as citizens, uh, create contacts with each other to overcome the, the, those events. Uh, but there is no, uh, no will on political side. That is a big question. So if you look on a larger scale, what happens now in Ukraine or in Moldova happened? It's a, it's a question like uh, why political uh, elites fail to prevent this uh, humanitarian catastrophe? Uh, why? Like, I mean, especially if we speak of these uh, peripheral regions in the empires where different uh, kind of empires disputed their territories, uh, be it Ottoman, Russian empire, and so on. Uh, like we, we see basically our territory as a kind of platform for experimenting these relations. And uh, this is how I also feel in this uh, situation that someone actually experiments in Ukraine, in Moldova, and uh, it's not only Putin, of course, it's not, but it's neither only citizens of Russia or, uh, who are uh, provoking this. So let, let's uh, think in that direction maybe more. Uh, I mean, last uh, news is that, for example, American embassy wants to have an embassy in very, very center of Chisinau. We have a former stadium, uh, it's a Republican stadium, which was demolished some 15 years ago because it didn't uh, correspond to the standards. And in the meantime, the government couldn't build anything uh, better instead. So it's like a field, a wild field full of uh, trees, which could be a nice park. I mean, it's not a bad idea to have maybe a park in the city. But then we have this uh, very insisting proposal to have a Russian, um, uh, uh, I mean, Russian American embassy in the very middle of the city, which creates another fortress from urban perspective, but if you look on these regional events, when um, embassies are uh, targeted by the military, this raises many other issues, like why to have a, you know, uh, uh, an embassy in, around in the very center where people live. I mean, it's uh, like a, a big question for me. <clears throat> Thank you, Marina. Do you have anything to add? You're muted. Nick, will you unmute? Uh... Yes, apologies. Uh, Marina, you should be able to turn on your mic now. No, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was just unable to unmute myself. I, I find it, to be honest, I find it very complicated to say anything because the topic is so complex. I can I can say a lot from the Bulgarian perspective, but as you know, probably Bulgaria has a very complicated relationship with Russia. So speaking of education and um, speaking about knowing your own history, I think we are now facing the exact same issue that we, especially my generation, but even more the older generations need to, to face and critically um, think about our own history and uh, reflect on it. And I just find it very complicated to speak right now because I don't want to shift the focus from Ukraine to Bulgaria. Although speaking from my perspective and what's been going on in Bulgaria, um, I might do it and I feel it's inappropriate. So um, I completely agree with almost everything that uh, um, Vladimir said, uh, because we are in a very similar situation. Um, I can give you a lot of examples on what's going on here. We have massive issue with misinformation. We have um, a 
a huge part of the society here is very pro-Russian, unfortunately, because the Russian propaganda in Bulgaria has been very, very strong for a lot of, for many years. Uh, we see the Russian army, especially the army, um, as uh, some kind of creature that has freed us from the Ottoman Empire and from the Nazi regime. We have a huge monument in the middle of our capital, Sofia, of the Russian army. That's one of the tallest monuments we have in our country, um, a monument of the Russian army with the gun in his hands. What I really like about our new uh, prime minister and our new cabinet is that they decided due to the circumstances now to at the end remove this monument from the city center as a gesture towards Russia, as a gesture towards supporting Ukraine. Of course, the Russian embassy came out with a lot of uh, misinformation uh, saying that it's not correct what we are doing, that we are untanked for, for everything that they did for our culture and history, blah, blah, blah. I really, I feel so bad for shifting the topic right now. Um, yeah, but basically what happened here uh, on the 3rd of March, Bulgaria had its national holiday, our freedom day, so to say, and a lot of cultural institutions, museums, galleries, and so on, boycotted this national holiday and were open to visitors in order to show um, not support to Ukraine, but boycott towards Russia, so to say, because we own our Freedom Day to Russia and we kind of even neglected our own Freedom Day because of the current situation. That's, I don't know even, yeah. I don't mean to educate nobody right now on our geopolitical historical background in Bulgaria, but just wanted to add to the point of how important education is. And that's a topic that's really relevant in Bulgaria as well right now. Thank you, Marina. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I'll just interject for a brief moment. I think that is one area that we can maybe all find common ground in. And that, that is education. And the education around what has happened, not just in the last 25 years, but the last 100 years, this is a very complex and complicated history that has been um, really just super fucked up, to, to say the least, right? So um, I, I think that's a starting point. And I think to, to, to Marina, to your, to your last point, for people to just gain an awareness of what these nations and what their cultures actually are. I can't, I, I think that is, that is just the starting point and it may sound super basic, but we have to start somewhere. I can't tell you for how many years my sole existence on Twitter has been yelling at major media corporations that it is not the Ukraine. So let, you know, let, let's just start there. And if we can, if we can get to that point in our, in our collective dialogue, I feel like we can accomplish much more. Thank you, Adrian. May I add, may I, may I add something else that, um, because we're, the conversation is so complex, as I said, and so multi-layered that we are kind of, I am getting a little bit lost in it. But uh, Lika said that basically the point is to, to discuss how we can help people and help not only the artistic communities because that's a humanitarian crisis. And yes, as in cultural institutions, we can help in this process of education. But um, my other question is how we as people and as organizations, how we can help people not only artists, not only curators, not only human beings being part of our network, besides spreading information and educating how we can actually proactively help. That's, that's my biggest question right now. Luba, I think you were gonna add something. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add to uh, Adriana's point about education. Uh, like 
the Ukraine. It's Ukraine, right? But uh, there is also the history of appropriation of artists and uh, writers uh, that are still uh, uh, labeled as Russian in Wikipedia. Uh, so um, Bulgakov, who was born in Kiev, it says he's Russian. Uh, Gogol, who wrote extensively about Ukraine, marked as Russian. Wikipedia is full of this stuff. So there is a, I don't know how else to say it besides decolonizing the, these Wikipedia entries, but um, maybe there should be another word for it. But for now, uh, let's, uh, uh, Ahmadova, as uh, Lika actually told me about that. Uh, so uh, uh, a lot of people think Malevich is uh, exclusively a Russian painter. Uh, and, uh, and the list goes on. So uh, letting people know, making museums acknowledge this, libraries, museums, Wikipedias, just uh, slowly getting back the, the cultural icons that were appropriated uh, and lost. Um, somebody mentioned Paul Salan. Uh, so these are... Uh, big gestures uh, that we can do and uh, that, that could also start talking about and educate people about how, like how wide the cultural appropriation was. Thank you, Luba. Um, did anyone want to add? Yeah, may I? Yeah, add? of course. Of course. Like, I'm, I'm sorry if, like, if, if the conversation comes back to, um, to Russia, but I feel like the urgency of the situations were in it and like Russia is there. So um, I, I believe strongly that for a Russian community and I'm, I'm not sort of insisting, it's just my belief uh, that being afraid of boycott um, is counterproductive. I think the fastest, the soonest Russian community embraces full on boycott, uh, economic, um, first of all, and largely also boycott of cultural Russian institutions for this very moment of urgency. This, the, the soonest we can shift this situation for Russians also, for those who believe in, in, in your country, being able to change. So I wouldn't confuse um, what we feel is a necessary measure, which is by quoting so many <clears throat> compromised Russian um, initiatives. Um, I, I, so I definitely wouldn't fear that. I would embrace it and only perhaps through this like very definitive action, something can change. Because if you acknowledge things, then some then the new things can start like losing. Now it's 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 viewed by Russians as like if you openly state that many artists that were appropriated by Russian Empire as Russian um, actually are in a lot of times Ukrainians or Georgians or Belarusians or something else, Russia doesn't lose anything. It creates a space for like future development. It's not like something to be feared and thought over. Like, I don't believe that, that, that like if I would be Russian, I would definitely wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't have that as a concern. Like, but because I've seen over this eight years, so many fights of like Russian artists over like origin of this artist or that artist or like how. Um, even um, Marat German, who is notoriously like in a position when he's so that Moma wrote like Kan Malevich's Russian artist of Ukrainian origin, which is like also not entirely true. Um, he because Malevich identified himself as a Ukrainian artist. He immediately like posted, "Oh, now like look, cultural sanctions started." Instead of acknowledging the truth, there is a backlash. Um, I think this the fastest this period and most like fearless um, 
the approaches to this to embrace the boycott i think it's it's it could be good um could be helpful um i don't know it, and in solidarity with all these countries with all eastern europe that was that undergone this period um i think that's something we can i don't know i agree with you and uh I, I think we are running out of time, but but I would love to continue this conversation. Um, and and also boycotting oil and gas would be good. Um, Nick, should we open it for questions from the audience? Um, I want to thank everyone again. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being in dialogue. Thank you for talking through awkward, uncomfortable, painful topics. Um, and uh, this is the first of many. Thank you, Ksenia. Um, I think just before doing like a very, we only have a couple um, questions, maybe if we want to just, since there's so many um, uh, guests today, if anybody wanted to make a final remark or ask a question um, yourselves, just to make a little extra room, feel free to just unmute and hop on. I just wanted to, to add that I'm very thankful myself that we have the chance to participate in such kind of a, conversa a conversation and that you are giving us the platform for it. Great, well, thanks um, Thanks for being here. If, if any of the guests have another comment or remark to make, you can jump in between the, um, the questions. Um, we're just going to turn um, first to uh, William Chan then, um, who, uh, let's see, you should be able to unmute. Um, yeah, I'm good. <clears throat> um, can you hear me? <clears throat> Hi, um, thank you for the, for the really um, insightful conversation. Um, I'm speaking as someone who really cares, but also is mindful that I don't know, and I'm just listening and learning as much as I can. Um, obviously, uh, we all have to approach this like emergency care and prevent every death possible, like a doctor would. But then on, a, on for someone like myself, um, in addition to supporting and, 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 and donating whatever we can, I think a big part of it is to interconnect all the injustices. And it might seem like it might seem like it's, it's like uh, we, we're doing the second layer. And I want to make sure that I'm not taking the energy away from the immediate care that, that's needed right now. But to prevent the next, uh, the next problem, even whether it's Ukraine 10 years from now or, or not a part of the world, we have to identify all the, and they're all kind of like, they're all very similar. It's people, it's, it's individuals or entities with too much power and influence. And because of that, it makes it really hard for people to speak up. And that goes, and, 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 and also, I think everyone needs, you know, everyone needs to feel like they could contribute at whatever level that they can. And if you're brave enough and have the, the ability to go and fight the war, that's great. But if you have the ability to tackle it on a very local level, I think that's just as good. Um, and, and, I, and then the reason I say this is um, what Poon is saying about uh, the reasoning is very similar to what Bush said about the invasion into Iraq and what the Chinese are talking about in, uh, against the Muslim and what they're doing in Hong Kong. And while, while it seems like we can't do anything about Ukraine today because we're in New York City or wherever it is, we could start kind of building that, that system, that preventive measure against the other powers that's five, 10 years down the road. And, and people are doing it in, uh, with MoMA Divest or the oligarchs, which is not just Russian oligarch, it is, it, is, it is the people, the board of trustees in many of these big institutions, whether it's government or museums, whenever, especially as artists, because we, we, we believe we are poor, so that whenever a billionaire gives us a $50,000 grant, it makes it really hard for us to speak out against someone who's given us $50,000, but they're billionaires. And I close with this, um, art, doesn't change anything, but it changes opinion, but it also needs action. Once, since everyone here's opinions already changed, we need to go and actually do something and rise up to this challenge. Uh, unfortunately, right now, there's a lot of injustices and we might have to do more than just sharing a post, 
Um, and and if whoever that could do something, just go that extra step if possible. And then, well, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thanks, William. Um, okay, we're gonna turn it um, to our very own Fong um, for a question comment. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, you guys, all of, all of you really, just uh, very um, echoing my own upbringing in Vietnam, having family members on both sides, my father and my mother, half was dedicated, committed to the vision of the Communist Party of the North, and the other half was seeking desperately for some democratic solution. At the time, it was very confusing between the transition to the tail end of French colonization in 1954 and the beginning of American involvement in the next 25 years. I heard you all, I applaud your various perspective, personal meditation, it's real serious lived experience. And I agree one thing here that I think is so urgent is how we as artists, I heard you William, artists might not provide any immediate solution. No work of art ever prevent the bombing of Ginika, of Hiroshima, Nagasaki and elsewhere. What it can do is that it mediate great urgency in changing the idea of deep understanding the same way we're trying to do here in regard to this information. That's where the usefulness of what we do in the art and humanities, how we subvert this information, just like when Hitler rose to power in summer of 1933, you all remember, he capitalized on economic rules. He capitalized on popular discontent and political infighting to take absolute power in Germany. And I remember it was the Austrian poet, the great poet, Karl Kraus, who say, the secret of the tyranny is to make himself as stupid as his audience so they think they are as clever as he. And that's where the job of what we do counts. You, we, count, we counter all of that. You know, it's that we have to mediate it through thoughtfulness and coming together. So when someone like former President Trump says social distancing, we counter him since he was so good in speed, using tweak to mobilize speed to destroy culture, destroy language, destroy anything. We do the opposite by amplify the slowness of culture like here. We talk as long as we need to, but we do, we have to do it every day. We have to match that stamina. When people are upset with power, we know this through history, you all, they don't go to sleep. They just do not go to sleep. I just now enter the second volume of Stephen Cockin, who will be coming out program the professor of history at Princeton University waiting for Hitler. He's working on the third volume now. I believe that it's great page turning as Robert Carroll, three volume of LBJ. So I think the idea, you are right, Luba, you are right by citing all the great Russian poet, Ukrainian writers and artists because People don't know about enough history. Young people particularly. I hate to say this, but this is where we need to subvert information into knowledge. Information stays as information, get nowhere. It had to turn to knowledge and action, as you say, William. It's both. Do you know? As the Japanese proverb say, vision without action is a daydream but action without vision is a nightmare. So we know that we are embodied by great, great thinker, artists, revolutionaries. These are amazing people that we know have won us, you know, like we must take sides sometime. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silent encourage the tormentors, never the tormented. Can't remember who said you all. But all I know 
is that your silent, our silent give consent. We know that. So I feel courage is what it takes to stand up and speak out, and we must. Courage is all what it takes to also sit down and listen. So it's just, just it's like both activeness or action has to be mediated so carefully, you all. And I'm happy that we all come together. I don't remember exactly, but Einstein maybe as an acceptance speech for Nobel Prize where he said the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. So that's what we are doing here. So I'm grateful. This is the beginning of many part to come. And we must be able to articulate, to be thoughtfully share all of our, at the moment, anxiety, feeling of very complex kind. But by doing this, coming together and sharing, it clear up some of our ambivalent of what we're trying to express. I really feel clarity, great clarity from having her, all of you speaking. So stay in there, please. Come in solidarity. Anton, thank you. Susan, thank you. Ksenia, Adriana, Julia, Anna, Luba. Who else I'm missing? Forgive me. Vladimir. But please stay together and to be continued because this is the beginning. The world is more complicated now and we can't afford when everything's going on in a broader perspective, very great depth of complexity. And we are being seduced by social media and, and everything else in between. We, our power is to think, to meditate of all of it and able to live through it in order to deliver at knowledge, hopefully wisdom. Hopefully wisdom, and that's our strength, not staying at information. So in solidarity, my gratefulness and thank you for you all. I send back to Carolyn and Nick and all of you, and let's be in touch from now on, shall we? Thank you, you thank you all. Thanks, Fong. Um, great, so we just wanted to one more time um, turn it back to the guests if anybody wanted to make a final remark um, or ask a question amongst to yourselves. Um, please I'll just take a, um, a pause to let you do that if you, if you choose to. I think generally um, it's very difficult to have this conversation while people are being bombed and people are dying and we're reading these news every single day. I'm like doom scrolling Twitter, the same as Luba, you know. Um, I think that each of us should find a Ukrainian that's closest to them and ask them what they can do to help. And every little bit counts and we should just deploy all the resources that we have available to help Ukrainians survive because the atrocities that are happening there right now, they're not unprecedented. They've happened before in many places, but the visibility that Ukraine has is also unprecedented. And we need to make use of it to make sure that this never repeats. So I encourage everyone to find someone, an individual, an organization, whatever it is, help them, whether with your time, or your money, however you want. Um, we're also doing everything we can. And um, as artists and as cultural practitioners, we, as Fong said, we play the long game. We work in very different um, timescales than wars occur. So, we should focus on artists' futures and we should focus on correcting um, the mistakes of the establishment because we're the only ones that will do it. If we don't do it, nobody will. So that is my final thought. I cannot agree more with Anton. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, 
it might be helpful, it might be not, but since I'm volunteering in a lot of organizations currently, if anyone you know or anyone listening to, to us right now knows somebody who se seeks refuge in Bulgaria or needs any kind of help related to Bulgaria, just hit me up on social media, on via email, however, just contact me. I will try to help any way possible. Um, yeah, that, that's basically it. Thank you both for um, those final um, comments. Um, so I'm really uh, happy and grateful to turn this over um, to some Ukrainian poetry um, to close us out today. Um, we have Ostap Kin with us. Um, he is the editor and co-translator with John Hennessy of Babin Yar Ukrainian Poets Respond, um, which is forthcoming this year. Um, and he's the editor of an anthology, New York Elegies, Ukrainian Poems on the City from Acad uh, Academic Studies Press. And he is also the co-translator with John Hennessy of a new orthography selected poems by Serhi Zadan um, from Lost Horse Press in 2020. And with um, Vitaly Chernetsky um, of, he's, of Songs for a Dead Rooster, um, selected poems by Yuri Andrukovich. I hope I'm getting these names right. Lost Horse Press, um, 2018. Um, so uh, please welcome Ostap and you can unmute. You should be. Hello. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. I hope you hear me well. Um, today I'm going to read two poems by Serhii Zadam, who is one of the most important voices in Ukrainian literature today. A native of Luhansk region, Serhii has been living in the city of Kharkiv for the last three decades, and he remains in the city now. Uh, the poems I'm going to read are from the collection A New Orthography, which I co-translated with John Hennessy, and which has a, an artwork by Hamlet uh, Zinkiewski, an artist from Kharkiv. So I am going to uh, read two poems, which were originally published in Ukrainian in 2018, uh, they are part of the cycle called We've Been Talking About War for Three Years. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read, uh, I'll do it in both Ukrainian and English. And the second one I'll do just in English. Uh, this one is untitled. A woman walks down the street. She stops in front of a store. She hesitates. She needs to buy bread. Buy it now or wait until tomorrow, she wonders. She reaches for her phone, talks with her mother, speaks sharply, doesn't listen, raises her voice. She yells as she stands in front of a shop window, as if she is yelling at, at her own reflection. She cuts off the conversation, not listening, and walks down the street, cursing her invisible and so even more hateful mother. She cries at some offense from her and because she can't for forgive her. She forgets about the bread. She forgets about everything in the world. In the morning, the first shelling starts. And now in Ukraine. Вулицею проходить жінка. Зупиняється навпроти магазину. Вагається. Потрібно купити хліб. Вдома закінчується. Купити тепер чи краще вже завтра, думає. Дістає телефон. Говорить із мамою. Говорить різко, не слухає, збивається на крик, кричить, стоячи перед вітриною магазину. Так, ніби кричить на своє відображення. Обриває розмову, не дослухавши, йде вулицею, проклинаючи невидиму і від цього ще більш ненависну маму. Плаче від образи на неї і від неможливості її пробачити. 
забуває про хліб, забуває про все на світі. На ранок починається перший артилерійський обстріл. And the second one. But now I know, he says, what war is like. And what is it like, I ask him. Nothing, he answers. He talks like he knows what he's saying. After internment, he speaks expertly about, about all of it. That is, with hatred. The way he talks, it's better not to argue. He won't agree anyway. He'll hold his ground, believing this is the greatest virtue in a time of war, to hold your ground, to deny the sun, to deny the tides of the ocean. So here goes. War, it's nothing. They talk about it like that, without adjectives. How did you feel? Nothing. How did they treat you? Nothing. How do you talk about it? Nothing. How do we live with all this now? Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Ostap. Thank you for that reading. Um, and thank you again so much to Yulia and Anna and Luba, Adriana, Susan, Marina, Anton, Vladimir, Vika, and Ksenia. Um, thanks to Simon Dove from CEC Arts Link. Um, we uh, put these on our YouTube channel, so this should be uploaded shortly. Um, uh, you can um, share this conversation with truly incredible today. Um, and please join us next Thursday. Um, at the same time, we'll have a continuation um, of this conversation. Uh, it's titled Dissident Artists in Solidarity with Ukraine. Um, tomorrow at 1 p.m. We we're hosting um, Dimensions of Science and Spirit, a conversation featuring Christine Davis, Amy Myers, Nina Sobel, Victoria Vesna, and Anne McCoy um, with a poetry reading by Tony Iantoska. Um, and thank you all so much again. We're really grateful to host this today. You can turn on your microphones to say bye um, as you leave. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. So much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luba. Thank you. 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 Thank you for the reading. Thank you, Lupa. Thank you, Lupa. Thank you, Thank you, you all. Thanks, Vesta. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. We hope to see you soon. Thank you. To be continued in solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity. Much love, you guys. Thank you.